Good morning, and welcome to St. Boniface on this 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Mass of the Resurrection can be found on page 215. That's 215. The Responsorial and Gospel can be found on page 1025. That's 1025. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, number 590, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above, number 590. the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the union of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
Sisters and brothers, we come together to celebrate these mysteries. We come together to celebrate the mysteries of our faith, the mysteries of our Lord living and dying for us. Knowing that we are sinners but loved by Christ, we go before our Lord asking for God's love and forgiveness. Sent to heal the contrite of heart. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, and lead us to life everlasting. Almighty and merciful God, graciously keep from us all adversity, so that unhindered in mind and body alike we may pursue in freedom of heart the things that are yours. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. In those days, I, Daniel, heard this word of the Lord. At that time there shall arise Michael, the great prince, guardian of your people. It shall be a time unsurpassed in distress since nations began until that time. At that time your people shall escape, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, Some shall live forever, 
Others shall be an everlasting horror and disgrace. But the wise shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament, and those who lead the many to justice shall be like the stars forever. The word of the Lord. from the second letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, every priest stands daily at his ministry offering frequently those same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But this one offered one sacrifice for sins and took his seat forever at the right hand of God. Now he waits until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being consecrated. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer offering for sin. The word of the Lord. Sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you. 
Jesus said to his disciples, In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that hour, of that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. These days, it seems like reading the New York Times or turning on the television to watch the news can be a combat sport. It certainly oftentimes is not filled with good news. And certainly as Christians trying to put our faith in action can seem like the opposite of good news. I think when we read the book of Daniel, we read a people that were similarly in a place of bad news. A people exiled from Jerusalem, conquered by a foreign power, and forced to live in an environment very hostile from not only just their way of life, but from their worship. But circumstances have brought the people in the book of Daniel and Daniel himself to high opportunity in the service of the Babylonian king. But he's left with questions on how he is to interact with this foreign authority. Should he withdraw from the corrupt and profane Babylonian government and seek a life pleasing to God in an enclave among other religious among other observant Jews? Or should he relegate his faith to a private or personal, perhaps praying to God in his closet while living the life of a Babylonian power and influence, indistinguishably from those around him? That dichotomy, I'm sure, is something that most of us have heard in our own country with our own Catholic politicians. Daniel chooses neither. Instead, he embarks on a promising career while publicly devoted to God. This gets him into trouble. The story of how he navigates these treacherous waters is both a guidebook and a case study, I think for you and for me in today's world. The book of Daniel can be perplexing. At the beginning of it, it begins rather straightforward enough with Daniel and his companions facing pressure to assimilate to the pleasures and vices of of the Babylonian royal court. He must speak up to difficult overseers. He has to make moral choices and deal with perhaps other colleagues, other Jews who are willing to make sacrifices that he is not. 
But the narrative becomes increasingly strange as we get closer to our reading from today, as dreams and visions and prophecies come into picture. At the halfway point in this book, the book becomes unmistakably apocalyptic, pretending the rise and fall of future kings and kingdoms using imagery of bizarre events and creatures. This end of times genre is notoriously difficult to interpret. As one of my scripture scholars told me, Daniel seems to have everyone that knows what it's about, but no one has an interpretation that seems to be all that convincing. The big picture in this book is clear, however. God is coming. God is coming to overthrow what is corrupt and arrogant in this kingdom, where God's people are living in exile. Although his people are suffering in the here and now, the faithful, their faithful suffering is one of the chief means by which, God, by which God's power moves. This gives them a surprising ability to thrive even in their suffering. It gives them a surprising ability for hope for the future and a meaningful role to play in both the present survival and future promise. Daniel recounts for us haunting visions which he reports in first person testimony. And the net result of all of these prophecies that he gives to us is of the tribulations of God's people at the hands of despotic leaders, but which end in triumph secured by God's appointed deliverer. The book ends with an exhortation of perseverance to Daniel. Happy are those who persevere and attain the, the 1,335 days. But you, go your way and rest. You shall rise for your reward at the end of the days. Oppression against God's people is a constant theme of the chapters of Daniel. But that theme of what do we do as a faithful people when we are found in exile? What do we do with our faith? Do we hide it? Do we practice it in private? Or, do we be, or are we like Daniel, in which we are both public persons and moral persons? Especially in times of trouble especially in times of exile? Do we choose to be salt and light, or we, do we simply turn off the lights out of fear? Like Daniel, our gospel reading from Mark is set against a background of turbulent economic times. During the Roman era, Galilee was undergoing major social upheaval with land increasingly owned by a wealthy few, often foreigners, and with the general movement away from small-scale farming to larger scale, a state-based agriculture. Those who had once been tenant farmers or even landowners were forced to become day laborers, often as a result of having lost their own property through loans taken up to pay Roman taxes. Set against such a background, it is small wonder that economic and fiscal themes emerge in Mark's narrative and in the teaching of Jesus and in an awareness of this social context allows us to appreciate undercurrents in these that we might otherwise have overlooked. I'm struck how our readings from today fit perfectly with what is going on in our times, uh, in our society today. There were two statements uh, this week, one a talk and one a statement made by bishops, which I stand, which stand in, in, in 
contrast with one another. And I think they fit in with both Daniel, what Daniel is attempting to teach us and what Mark is attempting to teach us. The first was part of a larger talk that Archbishop Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, gave uh, to a group of Catholics in Spain. It's worth reading the entire talk because I don't want to parody what he says, but you should always be on the lookout when someone begins a talk with, as we all know. <laughs> Do we now? That's how that talk began and how it ended was a, a parodying of modern racial justice advocates and advocacy with idol worship. It was a straw man argument that the Archbishop put forward. And that's not to say that racial justice movements and the people that pretend to follow and support them should not be critiqued. They absolutely should be. But how do we as Catholics engage in these racial justice movements? I know for myself, last summer here in Brooklyn, that meant actually not reading about them in the news, that meant walking with them. And the neighborhood I live in, in Crown Heights, that meant walking with fellow Catholics who were praying the rosary. That meant walking with our Jewish brothers and sisters who normally do not interact with the neighborhood, but they were interacting then and now out of the, their own faith to walk and march and advocate for social justice. Naturally, the archbishop was criticized. But then comes the contrasting view given by the Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky, in which he says that the gospel, the gospel, as we understand it in the Catholic Church, is inherently political. It can not help but be political. That the political nature of the gospel means that as we as Catholics, we don't rely upon politicians to advance that which we hold valuable, but we ourselves, we pray, we act, we love our neighbor, and we advocate on, on behalf of those who are on the margins of our society. That means as we experience things such as COVID, wealth disparity, climate change, that we ask ourselves as Christians, what is my role to play? Much like Daniel had to ask of himself in exile in Babylon. Now, it can seem that the easy thing for us to do as our world seems to be in constant chaos is to turn off the lights, is to run away from being paralyzed. It seems like the easy thing to do as people argue on whether to wear masks or not, or whether to get their children vaccinated or not, of whether global climate change exists or not, is to detach ourselves from the world. But as the Bishop from Lexington tells us, uh, the gospel is inherently political. As Christians, we cannot ignore the cries of the poor, the cries of those who are desperate, the cries of those who are impacted by all of the big and large questions of our times. It is a luxury for us to be able to hide our faith, to be able to hide our advocacy. No, the church ought not tell you as faithful people what to do. No, the church ought not ever lead with, as we all know. But the church ought to be a point of inflection, a point in which we are allowed to turn on the lights in our world, a point in which we ask the large questions of what is failing, to whom it is failing, 
Where is the fragility in our life and our world? Where is the chaos and to whom it is having the largest impacts? The events that Jesus describes in the Gospel of Mark are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. With the lack of clarity of these events and the whole timeline of of salvation history, it makes sense that Jesus would warn the disciples not to be led astray by those who would claim to come in his name, claiming, I am. It is tempting to cling to anything that promises a foothold at times when we feel everything is out of control. Or more pointedly, it is tempting for us to find a foothold in a political party, whether that is Democrat or Republican. It is tempted for us to find a foothold in a philosophy. It is tempting for us to find a foothold in a lot of other things other than the gospel message, which tells us fundamentally to love, love, and love. And so, sisters and brothers, as we sometimes, it seems, approach our end of times and our little apocalypses of our everyday life, it is as tempting as it may be to turn off the news or put the New York Times off to the side. We are called to turn on the lights to to spread the gospel news, the good news of Jesus Christ upon our world, and to pray and to act and to advocate. Amen. And so we stand and profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Virgin Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. To God, who is our life and our hope, let us make known our prayers. Joseph, it's the green, green folder. The next folder. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That our church and parish communities may be places of welcome for all God's people, we pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. That the nations and peoples of the world may put aside mistrust, prejudice, and hatred, and be united in building an equitable and secure future for all we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the earth, may we be good stewards of creation, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For parents who do not have enough to feed their children, may our generosity and compassion lead to lasting solutions, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all our benefactors and supporters, May they know our thanks, and may our gratitude inspire us 
to be generous with others, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That we might be trustworthy servants of the blessings we have received and share our resources with those most in need, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who suffer and are ill, especially Alexis Zikinolfi and Mary Ann Longo, may they receive the healing they need, we pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our dearly departed, especially Winnie O'Grady, Gerald Russello, and Pat Klein, may they experience the fullness of joy in God's presence forever, we pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. And for the people of the parish for whom this Mass is offered, we pray. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Gracious and life-giving God, you who are the beginning and the end of all things, May we treasure the blessings you have given us so that we may live our lives in gratitude and with generosity. We make these prayers through Christ our Lord.
Pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant, O Lord, we pray that what we offer in the sight of your majesty may obtain for us the grace of being devoted to you and gain us the prize of everlasting happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead. We hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so, with all the angels, we praise you. As in joyful celebration, we acclaim. created rightly gives you praise for through your son our lord jesus christ by the power and working of the holy spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore o lord we humbly implore you by the same spirit Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving thanks he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, the Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, 
And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, St. Boniface, St. Philip, St. John Henry Newman, and all those saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant, Francis, our Pope, Nicholas, our Bishop, Robert, our Bishop-designate, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of of your glory, through Christ our Lord, from whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you my peace, I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other a sign of that peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
we have partaken of the gifts of this sacred mystery, humbly imploring, O Lord, that what your Son commanded us to do in memory of him may bring us growth and charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit to do the notices today. Uh, first off, Father Mario, thank you for being with us and thank you for preaching the gospel so powerfully today. Thank you so much. Um, so the hospitality ministers are handing out cards like this. Uh, actually, this initiative comes from the diocese to help parishes throughout uh, the diocese uh, do stewardship. I th honestly, we've been doing it much the same way uh, for years, but I thought the card was effective. And normally around this time of the year, we uh, once a year do our little stewardship. Bill Weigel, the parish finance chair, will speak on the Sunday, December the 5th and um, I might get someone to give a little testimony the week after that. Um, but over the next two weeks, I want to speak to this card. Uh, so you can go to sleep next week if you're also here, all right? But this card has four purposes. One, we want to update our database. Uh, you notice that we're not giving out the bulletin uh, because of COVID, um, but that's prompted us to realize that uh, maybe we could save some trees and be more effective in electronic um, communication. So it's absolutely vital that we have clear uh, information about uh, your address, particularly your email address. So the hospitality ministers are giving you out a pencil. Would you, would you please take the time to fill in, in that portion of it? The second part of it is that, uh, as I said, we traditionally do stewardship during this time. If you're going to stay the same way that you've been doing it, you probably don't need to fill this out, though if you do, it's always helpful. Um, if you're new and you've not signed up for regular giving, uh, this would be the opportunity to do that. And we're going to particularly encourage you to do the um, electronic giving. You'll see up in the upper right-hand corner that uh, red little thing with the coat of arms in the middle of it, that's a QR co code. I'm so sophisticated, I now know the name of that, all right? It's a QR code. If you take your phone and you put your camera on and you place it over that uh, QR code, it will set a little set of brackets around it, yellow probably, and then above that, it'll set up a little a window and that will take you directly, if you touch it, directly to the uh, St. Boniface uh, online giving portal. Um, I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, during COVID, honestly, what saved us when there were no collections were that people continued to give uh, regularly through this method. Uh, it saved us, uh, thanks be to God. And um, if you're a regular giver and you give that way, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Tom can tell you, uh, that our, our accountant, that it saves a lot of time and money and effort and uh, a little bit of the environment. It's the preferred way of doing it, and if you're doing it, thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like envelopes still, um, please just indicate that, uh, and we'll continue to give them to you. Um, so, yes, if you're new and you need help with that, please let me know. Um, the third thing that is on it, and I thought it was a good initiative because the Finance Committee has been encouraging us to do this for a while, uh, is to indicate if, you're, if you want help with estate planning. Parishioner Sam Hall, who many of you will know, if you never heard him on WQXR, the newsreader, when Sam died two years ago, he left us in his will. Um, and it gave the parish $185,000, which frankly, uh, apart from the online giving, got us through COVID and has set us up. So it's a great thing to do. If you want help with that, please consider it. And then the last thing, uh, not the least important, is on the left-hand side down the bottom, you'll see um, volunteering. Would you indicate if you're interested in doing some volunteering? We're starting up our ministries. Uh, Teddy is our order server. Joseph did it last week. We're looking for some, for some servers. We're looking to renew our uh, ministries of reading and hospitality and uh, I think we'll start Eucharistic ministers again soon. 
and all of those committees that we run. Indicate that you would like some, some interest in that and then we'll find a way to reach out to you and, and try and get you involved. A parish is not just about our money, though it certainly is that. It's about how people contribute and we have a wonderful tradition here of people getting involved and, and being involved. And uh, if you want to know the community and relate to it even more deeply, that is absolutely the way to do it. So I, I encourage you to do that. Um, readers, the books are here for this year. Uh, please pick those up. Uh, many people brought in gifts for the food collection that we've been doing. We put them in the kitchenette over there because we've had some problem down the back. Uh, and um, that's where we put them. And uh, someone will take them up to Assumption where they will get properly distributed. Thank you for doing that charity for those who are in need. Phew. Thank you. Oh, on the way out, if you uh, have filled that in, um, please put it in the basket with the pencil or pen uh, to the hospitality minister. If you'd like to take it home, uh, please bring it back next week or get it to us somehow. It's really important. Thank you for taking the time to do that. As I said, we're only going to do this once a year, and uh, I think it's important to get it right. Thanks so much, everyone, for everything. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Yes, and may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks. Thanks, God. Please join us in our closing hymn, number 460, Jesus Shall Reign, number 460.